So last week, Josh started here. Or no, sorry, he ended here. This is, is what he said. We should def be defined by how we love the people whom society treats as inferior to us. And in biblical times, children, women, Samaritans, slaves, although, despite the fact that they all ran to Jesus, none of them were considered particularly valuable to Roman culture and society. They didn't have much worth, in other words. So what I want to talk about today is jumping off of this, continuing on from this, this question who, uh, that we ended with last week, who are the children, women, Samaritans, and slaves in our culture, and how do you love them? I want to jump off this concept from last week, and I want to further the same basic conversation from a different angle. Uh, the angle of leadership is the question that uh, I want to ascribe to this as, as far as how society treats those lower than themselves is based on how leaders define greatness and worth. So the basic question that we're going to ask today is what is worth to God? What is greatness? Um, how can someone achieve greatness according to God's standards? And what we're going to do is we're going to look at Deuteronomy 17. So if you have a Bible, open it up to there. I'm already opened it up to here. Uh, but I'm also going to just read off the slides for the most part. So, of uh, Biblical greatness can be defined in a lot of different ways. Deuteronomy 17 is a passage in which we find a discussion on the king of Israel and what will make the king of Israel great, worthy in God's eyes. Uh, and it, it flies in the face of what ancient Near Eastern kings defined as greatness. So we're going to discuss what an ancient Near Eastern king was expected to do, and how God's expectation on his prime leader flips human expectations upside down and defines greatness and worth in terms way higher than basic human ideas and pursuits. And that the action that God calls for his leadership is vastly different than the actions that most people ascribe to leadership by defining greatness and worth as, as something just way different than the mind of God. And then after we do that, we're going to look at some other passages throughout the Bible that take this picture of Deuteronomy 17 and ascribe it to characters and a couple of stories here. And we'll look at some, how the New Testament ascribes leadership and church leadership basically the same way as Deuteronomy 17 does for the king. And then finally, we're going to reflect on what modern churches do and do not do according to this standard of God. So, all together, this, this is what we're going to talk about. Worthy leaders are not defined by limitless power, sexual, or monetary success, but how effectively they walk in obedience to God, staying connected to him in the word and serving the good of others. So, we're going to be in Deuteronomy 17 before we read the passage. Just a fair bit of background here. Deuteronomy is a name from the Greek title of the, the book. It means second law. And they, they entitled it Second Law because it's basically Moses' farewell speech before he dies outside the land and Joshua leads the people into the land of Canaan. So this is Moses' last time to say everything that he needs to say. And he's saying it to a new generation, right? The people that God led out of Egypt in the Exodus are all dead. Before... Uh, after, rather, he says all this, he's going to go die outside the promised land due to his own sin in Numbers 20. However, when we pick it up in Deuteronomy 1, 1, and 2 for this background, we find that uh, Moses was not the only person to fail in the book of Deuteronomy. And this bears repeating here. It was the entire Israel of the Exodus that failed as a generation. They put God to the test. They rebelled. And as we're going to see, an 11-day journey took them 40 years. So let's, let's read this first two verses to Deuteronomy. These are the words Moses spoke to all Israel in the wilderness east of the Jordan. That is, in the Arabah, opposite Suf, between Paran and Tophel, Laban, Hazaroth, and Dizahab. It takes 11 days to go from Horeb, which is another term for Sinai, to Kadesh Barnea by the Mount Seir Road. So, Kadesh Barnea is the southernmost entrance into the land of Canaan. So, 
It was supposed to take them 11 days to go from Mount Sinai, where they received the law, to the southern border and start the conquest. It did not happen that way. Uh, it, it took them 40 years. So what Deuteronomy is doing is essentially picking up uh, 40 years later. An 11-day journey took 40 years because of the rebellions. And you can look at Numbers 11, uh, uh, sorry, Numbers 13 and 14 here. What happens is the spies go and spy out the land while the people are in Kadesh Barnea and the southern border of Canaan. The spies go in for 40 days and Moses is getting the people ready uh, to, to hear the report, come back, assemble the army and go and conquer. Instead, the spies come back. They don't like what they see. They like the land. They just don't like the people. They don't want to go up against the people. It's the remnant of the Nephilim, the Anakim and the Raphaim. So it's big warriors and they're just little in their own minds. And unfortunately, they're not thinking about God, so they have no faith of which to go in and conquer. And the spies spread that to all the people. And so God says, if you're not going to go in for the 40 days that you spent spying out the land, you will spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness. So Moses in Deuteronomy is picking up 40 years later. An 11-day journey turned into 40 years. But, but surely churches are not like that, right? I mean, we just, we get it right the first time. We never, we never need anything repeated to us every 40 years, right? Okay, so Moses is, is going to pretty much go over everything in Deuteronomy that Exodus has its, at, at Sinai. However, he's saying it to a different generation. Most of them were not alive, and even the ones who were at Sinai were very, very young, below the level of 20. So they would have been in that category of not being considered very worthwhile, they wouldn't have been considered adults. And they would have been low on the totem pole of Israel. So he's got, while he's going to repeat everything, a lot of what he says in Deuteronomy is basically uh, mis, no, sorry, re-emphasized for city living when they get into Canaan as opposed to living out in the country that they have been since Sinai. So we pick up in Deuteronomy 17, 40 years after Sinai. And maybe 41. All right. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you and you take possession of it and settled in it and you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us. Be sure to appoint over you a king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your fellow Israelites. Do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not an Israelite. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. He must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. Button. There we go. <laughs> when he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll, a copy of this law taken from that of the Levitical priest. It is to be with him and he is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of his, this law and these decrees and not consider himself better than his fellow Israelites and turn from the law to the right or to the left. Then he and his descendants will reign a long time over the kingdom of Israel. So let's start breaking this down. Verses 14 and 15a, Moses and, you know, God, is for saying, hey, one day you're going to want a king. This is still generations to come. He's thinking ahead like good leaders should, by the way. Uh, he, he's basically saying, look, your attitude's going to change as time passes. You're going to get settled. You're going to get comfortable in the land. And when you've been in your homes living there for a while and your sense of self has changed, you're going to want to change as a people. So your suggested change is, let's get ourselves a king. Why? That's the question. Well, the answer is, so that we could be like all the other nations around us. Is there a problem with this statement? Yes and no. Israel, of course, was not supposed to be like the other nations, right? Their calling at Sinai in Exodus 19 is to be a kingdom of priests. The entire kingdom and the entire people were supposed to be holy and set apart for God. They're supposed to live differently than the nations around them. And what the law sets up and yet foresees a change in 
is the governing status, right? So they're supposed to live, they're supposed to act in such a way that it was obvious to the nations that Yahweh was not only their God, but their true king. So, yes and no. There's a problem with this. At no point does Moses or God suggest that it's, it's a bad request to desire a king in and of itself. But the motivation for desiring a king is a problem because they want to be like the other nations around them. And that's, that's a different motivation. A human king could make or break fulfilling the call on Israel. But with their motivation to be like the other nations around this, it puts them on bad footing from the start of wanting a king. So yes and no. It's not a problem inherently, but their attitude for asking is the problem. So God does not reject their idea, their governing ideas, their, their, how they set up their government stuff. God doesn't sanctify those things. God doesn't choose them. He gets in the middle of what humans have already chosen, and he works with humans the way that, that they want. And when they want a king, he's, he'll say, okay, that's fine. We'll, uh, we'll get a king. Only what God is going to do here in Deuteronomy 17 is he's going to establish kingship defined by keeping the king's leadership holy and set apart. So that, you know, other types of kings throughout the world will live one way. This king will leave, live another way. And it will ensure that Israel will actually live according to her call. Maybe I should say his call. Israel is not a, mas- uh, not a feminine name. It's a masculine name. Israel should live according to his call. And the king is going to make or break that. It's either going to lead people to fulfill this call by God. Or it's going to lead them away from it. Because as leadership goes, so goes the people. Always. Good or bad. So what God does is he puts certain limitations on what it means to be king. Let's talk about what these limitations are for a worthy king in Israel. You've already read it. You probably already have some guesses. Anybody want to take a guess? What was the first requirement? Verse 15. The first requirement was. Suspense. I'm building suspense or, you know, this thing's building it for me. The first requirement is obvious. The king of Israel must be an Israelite king. He can't be a foreigner, right? That's pretty obvious. Uh, However, uh, nobody ever accused us sinner heathen pagans from actually picking up on the obvious. So Moses takes a sentence. He spells this out. Any king of the Hebrews must actually be a Hebrew king. And with this established, we're going to move on. We're not even going to touch on that. You the real crux of what it means to be king of God's people is found in three limitations, three things the king must not do. We'll call this the big three. Power, sex, and money given to us in this order in Deuteronomy. So we'll follow them in this order. And then we get one prescription. The king must do one big thing. All right, so Number one, power is limited. Verse 16 says the king must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself. You say, okay, Chuck, it it says the king can't get horses. I, I, I don't get it. Well, this is about the king not being able to build up a strong military power. You say, Chuck, it it says horses. I don't don't get it. What does that have to do with power, specifically military power? And the idea here is that horses are a reference to war horses, cavalry, and chariots, right? These were the dominant military technology of the day. In Moses' day, Egypt was the dominant power in the world, certainly in the region of the world that they're in. They are a superpower because they had the best military, and they had the best military because they had the best horses and chariots. This is shorthand language in verse 16. Slang, if you will. This is a Hebrew slang, short language for prohibiting the king from focusing his attention on actually building up his own power through military force and through military conquest. So you'll find in 2 Samuel 24, when David enacts the census, it was a violation of this idea. That's why he's so severely punished with three days of plague and destruction. He knows what he's doing. His commander of the armies tries to stop him from doing it, and he does it anyways. Solomon just blatantly breaks this prohibition. 
I mean, technically it's a limitation, not a prohibition, but Solomon just, you know, disciples and students tend to go well beyond their, their teachers in a lot of fields. Well, the next king tends to go further than the previous king in line. The, the next president tends to go further with the policies than the president of his party before him. These are recurring things and cycles throughout history and human leadership. Solomon just takes it to a whole new level of what his father David star- started. The difference is when, when David sees the consequences of what he's done, he's actually repentant. He buys the land to build the temple on out of solidarity and repentance with God. So power is limited. There we go. So this is the principle. Leaders are not considered worthy because they can force their will on others through conquest. That's the basic principle of this first prohibition, this first limitation. And it's important to to, to see it this way and to extrapolate this principle out of it because it's still common today to see people who can impose their will on others as powerful men as great men, as worthy men, and God doesn't view things that way at all. And probably the modern idea of a kingdom and the modern idea of conquest these days is uh, business, going into business and buying up other companies and playing Monopoly and getting a Monopoly on it and then it, it, sitting at the top of the, the Monopoly and the hierarchy that you build and whatever dominance hierarchy that you build, sitting at the top of it and saying, everybody as far as I see, is under my authority. I, pay all, I sign all their checks, I pay all their bills, and they do everything that I want. <laughs> so business moguls are kind of like an idea of saying, how much power can I get? How many things can I buy up? How much more can I in, in expand my power? The problem is greatness and worth is not a matter of getting everything that you want, according to verse 16. And if it was true for the Israelite king, it's true for all of us in some sense. Number two, sexual conquest is limited. Verse 17 says, he must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. So the king is not allowed to build up his harem. Ancient Near Eastern kings were the primary men responsible for polygamy. They were not the only ones, but they were the primary ones. In fact, it was virtually impossible in the ancient world to be a king and not be a polygamist because your treaties with other nations were through marriage. And if you're going to make treaties with more than one nation, it all but guaranteed you were going to have more than one wife. And that's kind of the starting point for polygamy. It's not the end point, but it's brought up here. And this language here might not be specifically for wives in the Hebrew. It it could just mean women in general. Uh, Ancient Near Eastern kings, they did not just take wives. They commonly kept women they chose or had chosen for them by servants. If you read the book of uh, Esther, they had these women sequestered in, in their own parts of the palace. And they called these collection of women harems. If you were married to them, you were a wife. If you were unmarried, but you were still allowed to sleep with the king, you were a concubine. And there's a connection here between military and sexual conquest. Think about it. These ideas are linked conceptually in the minds of the ancients. The idea was that you could show your masculinity or your kingly prowess by dominating as many women as possible. In fact, The bigger the harem, the greater the king. The more worthy you were. In fact, when you conquered another king, that king would add the conquered king's harem to his own harem. So a great way to build up your kingly status was to go and build up your military, conquer another king, and then take his harem. Give you an example. Absalom in 2 Samuel 16. This is a son of David. He rebels against his father, David. He leads a coup and David flees Jerusalem and Absalom comes in and takes Jerusalem. And in 1620 and 22, he asks his advisors, all right, we got the city. We got the town. We're in control now. What do we do to keep the control? What do we, what do we do so that the people know who's in control now that David's gone and David's not in control? His advisor says, pitch a tent in full view of everybody, go into the tent and sleep with all of David's concubines that he left. He took some of his wives with him. He left his concubines in charge of the palace. 
So that's what, that's what Absalom does. He pitches a tent, he goes in and he conquers the women. And now everybody knows David's women belong to his son. So his son is in charge. Let that sink in for a minute. So conceptually conquering people and conquering women were united in the ancient world. And if you can understand that, start looking at the ways people conquer today. Is it really any different? Men still test their manliness by how many women they can bed. And for you teenagers, you know, it's how many women can you get to date you for a couple of weeks and then you move on to the next one when you get bored or when a problem comes up and you're playing a numbers game. Hmm. Here's the problem with playing a numbers game. Th- this limitation is linked with not following other gods. You conquer a land, you get the women, and those women worship and bow down to other gods. So an Israelite king goes and he conquers the next-door neighbor, and those next-door neighbors are pagans. And he takes those women into his harem, and he's sleeping with those women. And those women have the potential to lead his heart astray towards other gods, which, of course, is exactly Solomon's problem. David's weakness is women. But again, disciples and students go way beyond their teachers. So Solomon takes it to the nth degree. And the, the scripture says he has 700 wives and 300 concubines. That's not a literal number. Don't freak out. Seven and, and three equal 10. And that's a number of talking completion. So seven y, 700 wives is a way of talking about the perfect ideal number of women. And 300 concubines is the additional ideal number of women on top of that. So the the, the context of kings, when it says this, is not literal. He would die of dehydration. It is very much trying to paint Solomon as the the greatest king that, that an ancient could possibly think of or understand. The problem is he's not great according to God's own standards and teachings. More sexual partners will not make anyone more worthy, male or female. That's the principle to walk away with from this verse. To the contrary, it will destroy our worth to be linked sexually to anyone beyond heterosexual monogamous marriages. And it took the the people at the Bible a long time to figure this out. And God just lets the situation play out. He never technically calls for polygamy to be done away with anywhere in the Bible, but humanity figured it out because God let their failures compound generation to generation until we voluntarily give it up. The the, the problem is polygamy is making a comeback. Isn't it? Oh, you don't hear about polygamy so much. You hear about polyamory. You hear about all these men who are trying to say, oh, my wife doesn't satisfy me. You know, you know, so we have an open marriage and, and we practice polygamy and it's, it's ethical polygamy and all this stuff. Like there's no such thing. There's no such thing. We still do this today. We still try to define our worth by conquering in military formats. And if we can't conquer in business and military, we sure try and conquer sexually. Weak men still try to define their masculinity by how many women they can bed. And the modern form of the harem is the digital harem. Through online pornography. How many men or boys trap their manhood? Keep it from growing. Keep it from maturing and developing. Because there are, uh, some of them are just afraid of missing out. Right? They got that FOMO. Fear of missing out. How many do I have to sleep with to be a man? One. Marry her. Be faithful to her. That's masculinity. Have children. Be a father and raise your children. That's masculinity. Femininity, mature femininity is the opposite of that. So this idea fails. Sexual conquest does not equal worth. And neither finally does riches. Riches are limited. Verse 17 says he cannot accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. So the king must not build up his bank account. Didn't have bank accounts there, but the, the, the limitation is all about rejecting self-reliance to remain God-dependent. There's nothing inherently wrong with gaining money. Like everything else, it just its potential for abuse is legion. So in the Bible, riches are defined slightly different 
It's not about how much money you have in a bank account. To be rich according to biblical standards is just to have more than you need. And we should understand that because it probably means that in America, despite Bidenomics, we're all pretty much rich. We all have more than we need. You have a running toilet. You have more than the ancients had. If you have a working fridge that can stockpile food, you had more than is necessary for your daily needs, your daily bread. So before any of us claim we're not rich, according to biblical standards, we are, and we need to maybe impose these limitations on ourselves because we want to be God-dependent, ultimately. And we don't want to develop self-reliance, but that was the temptation for ancient Near Eastern kings. You trust God, you get the kingdom, you run the kingdom, the kingdom goes well, you get successful, and you stop trusting God. What, what was that verse like three weeks ago when you were still here? It was like Proverbs 30 or something. Lord, do not give me great riches so that I stop trusting you, but do not give me too little so that I steal or something like it. Pro- I think it was around Proverbs 30. I'm, I'm just thinking of it off the top of my head. But it's like, it's that same basic proverbial idea limitations and commandments of God are not to stop you or rob you from having life. They're the guardrails to actually keep us from having the kind of life that's actually worth living. So the principle is greatness, worth has nothing to do with gaining riches. Greatness, worth, it, it, it's not defined by an ever increasing bank account. Or as I once heard one preacher remark, God must not care very much for gold if he paves the streets with it and has everybody walk all over it. Yeah, we care about gold. I don't think it really matters to God. I, I never really understood historically how gold became the standard for riches. I know, right, it's, it's like a rare orb. Or not orb. I get it. Uh, but it's like, it's, it's just shiny metal. Are we just animals attracted to shiny things? I mean, come on. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything to God. And God will not view you as having a dollar in your bank account as being less than the guy with the million. So if it's not power, sex, or money, the three major components that it actually meant to be an ancient Near Eastern king, what is worth in the mind of God? 18 and 20, spell this out. The king should read and study the word of God so that he can walk in obedience to God's ways. That's a summary of verses 18 through 20, and that is how God is going to define greatness. So let's break this down. First, the king has to actually have the word. Verse 18 said he has to have his own copy of God's word, which, you know, at this time, does Moses mean Deuteronomy? Does he mean some sort of form of the Pentateuch? I don't know, but as the definition of God's word expands and changes across time as more of the Old Testament is being written more into the New Testament, I think our definition of having the word could expand until you have that Bible sitting in front of you. We need to be connected to all of God's history, all of God's stories, all of God's teachings, if we want to have any chance of greatness and worth. But, you know, in an agrarian culture of Moses' day, they were dominated not by written communication, but by oral communication. So everybody spoke, but very few people were literate and could write. It was primarily the king and his administration that had access to the written education of their day. So Moses, God, Uh, through Moses, puts this limitation on the king and says, here's a great thing to actually have. My word, my teachings, my laws, my decrees, have that above all else. So, you know, if you're going to be a leader, you're going to need your textbooks. And when you get a copy of God's word, what do you do with it? Because it's not merely enough to just have books, even God's books. I have over 2,000 books minus a digital library, okay? Trust me, it's not enough to have them. You actually have to read the text. So that's verse 19. The law copy that the king is supposed to have is to be with him, and he is to read it all the days of his life. So the king's copy of God's word can't go on a shelf forgotten. It has to be with him. Yet it's not merely to be with him wherever he is. He actually has to read it All the days of his life. How many? All the days. And yet he can't just read it. He actually has to absorb the word. He is to read it so that he may learn to revere Yahweh, his God. You can't learn 
who God is and what he's like, ignoring the stories that tell you who he is and what he's like. The text that he wrote down and passed along to all the people says, this is so important, everybody actually has to pay attention to it. So I'm going to write it down and pass it along and preserve it generation to generation in one form or another. If it's important enough for God to write down, I think it's important enough for us to read. And if it's important enough for us to read, it's important enough for us to absorb into us, into our minds, into our thinking. And ultimately, it is important enough to obey. He must learn to revere Yahweh as God and follow carefully all the words of his law and these decrees. Why? Because God and this potential human king of Israel are not equal. God is superior. God is in authority above the king and above all leadership. And we are all accountable to follow him and his ways. So beyond merely having it or reading it or being exposed to it so that you absorb it. The idea is to actually live by it, walk in it, obey it. If you're going to lead God's ways, you're going to actually have to understand who God is what he's like and what he wants done in his creation and in his kingdom as the creator to get there. You're going to actually have to spend time with God. What is the primary responsibility of being a king or being a leader in God's kingdom or amongst God's people? You actually have to learn the word of God. You have to learn how to study it. You have to learn how to properly respond to him in it so that you can live out and and effectively administer his will in and among the people. To do that, you have to have the word, you have to read the word, you have to absorb the word, and you have to obey the word. There is more to being king, and there is more to being a leader. There is more to being a man. There is more to being a woman. But there is not less. So if we boiled it all the way down to these four things, where are you at in this process? Because again, America, rich place. We have access to the word of God. I don't think anybody here will fail by, the, by sundown. If you don't have your own copy, ask and you could be given it before sundown, right? We're rich enough, but that doesn't mean that anybody here is actually reading the word. And if you're not reading it, you're certainly not absorbing it. Now, again, oral communication. This counts, hopefully, as absorbing some of the word of God. That's why I take people's face and shove it up in the Bible whenever I'm preaching, you know, to help you actually deal with this process. Let me say it like this. If you want to step up and lead, you first must kneel down and read. And, and see, <laughs> t-shirt worthy. I didn't even think about that. There you go. Uh, I, I get 5% of all profits in marketing, but don't worry, I'm not going to build up my bank account. Um, <laughs> that is true. I, I didn't even think about that. That is actually a good phrase. And I did write this phrase. I, this just came to me like two days ago. So very late in the process of this. If you want to step up and lead, you first have to kneel down and read. Because whatever leadership is, whatever greatness is, whatever worth is, whatever power is, If you can't just sit down and read, you're not going to achieve anything of worth, of greatness in the mind of God. You're going to end up chasing the wrong voices, going to the left or to the right. That is what you're going to do. You're going to end up defining yourself as better than your fellow Israelites. Look, verse 20 says he can't consider himself better than his fellow Israelites. So God, look, God defines worth by how much we pursue him as the, the top authority and the top priority in life. And out of that pursuit, serve the good of others, right? This is basic and and simple. And it's so simple that we often overlook it. Just like verse 15. Oh, right. An Israelite king should be an Israelite. It bears paying attention to. Because look, how are you going to treat the slaves, the women, the Samaritan, and the children? If you define worth as beating the other guy down so that you can stand on his back. It's not going to be the kind of worth that God finds worthwhile. Instead, you'll you'll disobey the problems here. The, the, The thing is, if I go back to this slide, if we can master this basic lesson, it will save us from the potential faults and abuses of power that we get in verse 20. Verse 20 says he's not to consider himself better than his fellow Israelites. 
So out of the understanding of the real king of Israel is God, the human king has to learn obedience to the authority over himself if he's to teach and expect obedience of the people beneath him. He's not merely allowed to make demands on others and and live life off the benefits of being king. But that's what ancient Near Eastern kings did, and the king of Israel is not supposed to be that way. The king must believe he must not believe he is above God's law, as if it didn't apply to himself. Everyone is accountable to God, even the highest of human powers. And how often do human powers live as if there's no consequence for their actions because they're powerful enough to get away with, with it before humans? Well, I don't care how powerful you are, you're not powerful enough to get away with it for God, who is holy and just. And a good example of this is, um, you know, Paul to Philemon and Philemon's expectations towards Onesimus that Paul places on him. He says, look, I could charge you to do this out of my power as an, uh, an apostle. I would rather appeal to you in love. Just because you're the master of Onesimus does not mean you should treat Onesimus the way that everybody else treats their slaves in this empire. I expect something more out of your power and your leadership over your own people. Because he's a believer, he's a child of God, you're a believer, you're a child of God, I'm a believer and I'm a child of God, Paul says. We're all equal before God. So this hierarchy of power that we could admittedly talk about and does exist in the world is supposed to operate so that those who are at the top of the hierarchy don't crush the people at the bottom. And if you could understand this properly as yourself, that you're all equal before God, that understanding of a proper relation to God will create that humility. Humility is thinking accurately about yourself. And thinking accurately about authority and power means that God's above you and you're on the same level as the guy sitting next to you. It doesn't play that way in human relationships. You have to structure them hierarchically to make things happen. If everybody's equal, nothing gets done. If everybody has the same amount of power, Nobody actually leads, but the proper way to lead with the authority and power over a community is to actually step up and be a servant. And the proper way to serve the needs of others is to actually kneel down and read the word of God. What's your other option? Turn to the right or to the left in verse 20. So the king's not allowed to go out after other teachings that are not Yahweh's teachings. Other voices that say, hey, if you're going to be a good king, build up your military, build up your harem, build up your bank account. Hey, you have a right to this. You need to be paid for your work. Come on. Your salary needs to be higher. People should listen to you. People should do what you say. Come on. You're the one in the position of power. Oh, man, if if your wife's not satisfying you, get a new wife. Get a new woman. You deserve all these things. These are the tempting voices that try to define power and greatness and worth in all of these ways. Well, when worthy leaders reject these voices and they cling to God by daily devoted reading and study of his word, and they seek to live under his authority, not away from his own uh, power, you get the statement at the end of verse 20. If he will do this, if he will step up and lead through reading, he and his descendants will reign a long time over the kingdom in Israel. So, connecting with God through something as simple and basic as actually reading his word absorbing it, taking it into yourself and and living by it actually brings lasting stability in life. Not merely for himself, which is good enough for the immediate people around him, his immediate family, his immediate kingdom, and it'll roll over to his sons and his descendants. And hopefully they do even better than him. And they learn from his mistakes and they don't repeat those mistakes just because disciples tend to go further than their teachers. That's not a bad thing. You can't do better if you learn from them. So again, God defines worth by how much we pursue him as the top priority. So now at this point, you may be thinking, ah, who cares, Chuck? We don't even have a king. Why should we care about such teachings in the church today? Well, if it isn't already implicitly clear by now, what God says about kingship here, you could easily swap for worth, for greatness, in just about any area of life that you could think to apply it to. And we would find the same basic teachings throughout the Bible. Greatness is not about money, sex, or power. It's not about any other object that you could pursue, that you could name, that you could put a price tag on. Greatness, power, and worth are about things that God has made such, than such lowly pursuits to be what life is about. 
Life is ultimately about pursuing God, who is above and beyond all of these things. If you want the highest good, aim for the highest good. But there's nothing higher than God, so aim for God. Make everything in life be about him and everything of these lesser, lowlier pursuits in creation. You'll just have them there as icing on a cake to enjoy. So let's look at some other passages. 1 Samuel 16, 6 and 7. This is, this is Samuel being sent to the house of Jesse to anoint Saul's replacement. But he doesn't know which one is Saul's replacement. When they, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab, Jesse's oldest son probably, and thought, surely the Lord's anointed, the Lord's Messiah, by the way, stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. I mean, that's, that's pretty much in narrative form, God applying his own law of Deuteronomy 17. Psalm 1 and 2, I, I, uh, Psalm 1 verses 1 and 2. I've preached this psalm here before. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step of the wicked, stand in the way of the sinners, and sin in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night. It's like Deuteronomy 17 that speaks specifically about the king. It's like the psalmist takes that exact same language in the psalm and doesn't apply it to the king. He applies it to anyone. Anyone whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night can have the same goodness and blessings that God wants the king to lead the people in having. I think he's actually taking his poetic language in this psalm straight from Deuteronomy 17. Jeremiah 9 23 and 24 says this, this is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast in their wisdom or the strong boast in their strength or the rich boast in their riches, but let the one who boast boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. It's not boasting about wisdom. It's not boasting about strength, like military strength or riches, like you're building up your bank account. Nothing like that can compare to Yahweh. Nothing like that can compare to Jesus Christ, the true sovereign ruler of the world. So don't boast about your lowly pursuits or how much you've achieved in this life. Let's move on over to the New Testament. This is an interesting story. Acts 6, the picking of the first deacons. In those days, the number of disciples was increasing. The Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 gathered all the disciples and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and, and wisdom. We will turn over this responsibility to them. We will give our attention to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The whole reason the first deacons are selected is actually to give freedom to the apostles to carry out the responsibility of prayer and devotion to the word of God. The, the prime 12 leaders of the church, their only expectation and devotion is say, we need to be free to pursue this one thing. I wonder if they knew Deuteronomy 17. <laughs> I expect they did, and I expect that they're basing their ideas of leadership over the church on Deuteronomy 17. And if that's not clear, you just look at what Paul actually says in some of these verses. And, and, and it's the red parts that I've highlighted are the closest to what Deuteronomy explicitly says. So pay attention to that as we read 1 Timothy 3, the first three verses. Here's a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires an overtask. An overseer is like an elder or a pastor. Same term. Pastor is not a term in in as an official office in the Bible. We've adopted it as such, but there's really only elders. Then there's deacons, but deacons have no governing authority according to the New Testament. So whoever aspires to an overseer, elder, pastor, shepherd, whatever, desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle. Rejecting military power and the ability to dominate others. He cannot be that. He has to be gentle. He can't be quarrelsome. He cannot be a lover of money. Paul's list of qualifications for elders is by no means exhaustive. Yet they tap into the same basic principles of Deuteronomy 17. About the king of Israel. The elder has to have certain positive qualities and not possess certain negative virtues. 
If you stop and think about his wording here, all I'm saying is that Paul is encapsulating the big three of ancient Near Eastern kingship in his words here. And then he's rejecting them and he's embracing the positive qualities of Deuteronomy 17 as a model for church leadership in the church. The same thing is echoed in Titus 1, 6 through 9. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe, who is not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick tempered not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciple, uh, dis- disciplined. Rather, He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppress it, oppose it, rather. I can read. It's, it's, it's all Deuteronomy 17 recapitulated in their own words and their own writing. So the idea of what makes someone worthy is actually the same thing as it was oh, 3,000 years ago in Moses' time. Okay, I'm spitballing here. I, I, I'm rounding down a little bit over 3,000 years when Moses said this. It's like, so, so let's talk about modern church pursuits. Let's talk about us. What do lots of modern American churches spend their time pursuing? And do modern churches seek the big three? Or do we fulfill verses 18 through 20 as the basic call of discipleship? And the answer can be found in what the leaders themselves are or are not pursuing. So what do these modern churches pursuing? Are they pursuing larger congregations? I mean, that's, is that really any different than building up your military? The larger congregation, it, it's there to be, you know, so that the, the leader has somebody to have power over and has somebody to influence. And if you're a narcissistic leader, you want more people for the sole purpose of gaining more influence and more power. Control, getting everything that you want quickly and efficiently and calling it greatness. You think there are churches that just get bigger, that just pursue the numbers, just so the pastor can have a larger congregation to boast about? Maybe the congregation is supposed to get larger so that there's more people who love the pastor. You know, maybe we could think of extrapolating out of this in some sense that uh, the congregation is in some ways, directly or indirectly, the pastor's narcissistic harem by which he determines his own greatness. He's conquered these many people. He's let these people into his life. He's the Lord and King of these people in his own mind. And they love him and they stroke his ego. And then plenty of times more and more, I know my generation is fed up with the pastors who actually fall into sexual sin with people in their congregation. Happens way too much. Because they've chosen a, one of the big three, or two, or maybe three of the big three. Because the more people they get, hey, the more money they get. Their salaries go up. Their budgets increase. Hmm. They're chasing money. And, and these days, it's very easy to chase fame and influence on the internet. And the pastor getting a book deal and all that stuff. And the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that when churches pursue these things... They're neglecting what genuine discipleship is actually about. Connection with God through reading. And churches are corrupted in no different ways than ancient Israel was corrupted by the leadership of her kings. These aren't things in the past. Deuteronomy is good for something. It is the word of God. Read it. You will find the same lessons encapsulated 3,000 years ago necessary for today. When pastors truly care about discipleship and they put the people first by actually disciplining themselves to put the word of God first in their own life. As the apostles did. As Paul was calling for and as the king was supposed to do in the ancient world. And then they teach others that same rhythm and replicating that same process in their lives. So closing challenge. How do you define greatness? How do you define worth, and is it in line with what God has said in Deuteronomy 17 or other places? 
Do you spend time in the word? Do you spend time in prayer? Are you a boss at work? How do you lead those people under your authority? Because it's no different than, than Philemon to his slave Onesimus. And what Paul is calling for there is no different. Would you be willing to cut down your work hours if it meant, you know, making time for God, for reading his word and developing a prayer life? Or is it more concerning to you to just get the money and build up that bank account? We need to think about these things. Do husbands and fathers in this room lead their households with this perspective? You can make money by all means. But do you put God first in your household? Do uh, wives and mothers raise their children with this intention? If you're queen of your household, do you follow this teaching? And do we in America consider greatness the way that God does? Or do we prefer the American dream? You know, get rich or die trying, maybe? Politically, are we just trying to gain more political power and calling it more glory? On social media, are we just looking to get more followers? So more people that love us, more worth out of that. I mean, for 60 years, American culture has defined sexual freedom as the ability to indulge your sexual impulses without restraint, claiming that the more you do it, the better off you'll be. How's that working out for us? Maybe we actually want to apply some limitations here to ourselves, And maybe our God has actually given us the exact limitations to place on ourselves. And it's so obvious that we overlook it. Maybe he defines worth in such simplistic terms that it's just almost over our heads. We need to take a moment and think about it and ask ourselves the question, where are we getting our worth from? If it's not found in connection to our God and serving the needs of others, we're not really stepping up. And I would argue if you're not willing to kneel down and, and read as the most basic acts of service towards the community, you're not going to be willing to step up and lead or do anything else to serve other people. Not in the long run. You'll do it when it's convenient, maybe. But you won't really do it because you won't inconvenience yourself enough to just take time and spend it with God. So ask yourself these questions. Figure out where your worth is coming from. And let's continue to be a community that defines ourself and our worth by our connection with God. And his greatness in us. Let's pray.